Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, how are you? I hope not too exhausted after all the hour, uh, very hard hour work. I hope it was, it was useful. So let's take a break from R a little bit. And so what I would like to do um, in the next um, hour and a half is to come back to the principles of statistical methods. And what we did yesterday, we talked about the experimental design and the importance of design for reproducible research. So today I will spend more time talking about the analysis. And just like as yesterday, the methods that we will discuss will be very, very basic. And I think many of you probably have seen these things before, but I also think that it's very important for all of us to be on the same page, especially as we move on to more advanced things after that. So let's just uh, review a little bit what we uh, talked about yesterday in terms of why statistical methods are important for the experiments that we talk about here, right? And we said that we had different sources of variation, such as technological variation, instrumental variation, and so on, but the biological variation is the most important source of variation, right? And so yesterday we said that statistics can be thought of as a uh, collection of methods for making wise decisions from data. So today I would like to also emphasize the importance of reproducible research. And in fact, well, obviously we all want to make sure that our research is reproducible, but I would like to also kind of highlight the fact that it's, reproducibility is not a thing, it's a spectrum, right? So there's a, actually a spectrum of type of reproducibility that we may want to consider. And well, of course, on the one side of spectrum, we have uh, data which are publication only and are not repeatable or reproducible in any way. And we want to have as few of those as possible, right, if we can. And from that point on, we have a sequence of things which we may want to consider. So repeatable data analysis is the analysis when you, are, you have a publication where there is a data and there is a analysis method, and you want to be able to run the same analysis on the same data as described and have the same results. So this is only possible when the full workflow was completely automated and documented, right? And unfortunately, even that is a challenge in many areas, and especially in tools where, which require point and click and some kind of manual consideration. But we want more than that. So oftentimes when we do data analysis, some decisions are necessary, but they're not really critical. So for example, choices of some parameters, such as do we use 10 peaks for quantifying, uh, 10 points to quantify a uh, peak, chromatographic peak, or do we use eight points, right? So clearly this will not give us the same numeric values, but if the number of points is large enough, qualitatively our results should not depend too much on that, right? And so reproducible data analysis is the workflow where we change some non-essential parameters and we should be able still to get qualitatively the same results. So this is an important, but then we also want more. We also want to be able to have a repeatable experiment where we have the same samples. If we reanalyze them again, we will not have the same numeric values, but we should be able to have the same answer. And the gold standard of reproducibility is actually a reproducible experiment itself, where not only we have so we will have the new biological material, new individuals, and we apply same or similar type of workflow, and we get qualitatively the same answer. And so statistical experimental design is really key for this part. Because without attention to biases and sources of variation, it's really not possible to even qualitatively reproduce um, the results. So today I will kind of focus a little bit more on that. So what are the statistical methods which we may want to implement, which would allow us to have the results which really characterize the sources of variation. So let's take a look at that. So I will talk about very, very simple um, method, essentially a t-test, right? And we'll talk about different types of uh, things which are important for that. And first I will tell you how good it is, and then I will tell you how bad it is. So that will, that's the plan for uh, for the day. So let's just remind ourselves what happens kind of in my mind or in any mind of a statistician when we think about 
the second goal of the second statistical goal of our experiment, so class comparison, right? So if you remember the abstractions we had in mind were that there are two populations out there, and again for simplicity, let's say they're healthy and disease, and so they're constants which we assume exist out there. So there's a mean abundance of the protein among all healthy subjects and mean abundance of the protein among all disease subjects, and we're interested in whether these proteins are on average regulated up or down uh, in the disease population. And these constants, they exist, but we will never know what they are, and the populations are too large, so we cannot investigate every single person in the population, so what we will do is we will take from this population a subset of subjects which we will include in our study. And these subjects on this particular day, they will have some values of protein abundance which are also unknown for us. So they're unknown constants. What we will do is we will take the subjects and we will collect measurements on the subjects using a technology which is itself noisy. And so what we actually observe is peak intensities, right? And so our goal is to take what we see here and make conclusions about what we are interested in, right? And just to remind you, so the bias is when this is systematically different from this, and inefficiency when we have large variability, too much variability associated with what we measure to make really any meaningful statements about what we want to see. So this is the, um, this is the idea. So how do we proceed with that? So well, first of all, and we already talked about this uh, yesterday, that we work on a log scale, right? And the reason for the log scale, as I mentioned uh, before, is that the statistical properties are much easier to deal with when things are additive. So when we consider sums or differences between things as opposed to ratios between things. So if we now look into this a little bit more, so essentially if we want to think of comparing these two groups, so this will be the mean of the healthy group, this will be the mean of the disease group. If we think kind of in terms of the analytical chemistry terms, so we want to consider a full change of this protein abundance between one group and the other group. But because each group has many subjects, so we have some kind of representative summary value of group one and some kind of representative summary or typical value of group two. And so we can refer to full change between the two groups as a typical value in group one and typical value in group two. Now, if we take the log, so log of the full change is the difference of the logs of these individual values, right? So this is really what we're talking about. And so now I'm just kind of writing a little bit more math. So I occasionally will have formulas, but I don't really want to uh, kind of overwhelm you with that. So let's just take a look. So what I just said here, right, we look at what we observe, right, and we have some summary in one group minus some summary in the other group. So this is what we're interested in. So let's say, just for the sake of the argument, that the summary in the group is the mean of all the abundances on the log scale, right? So I'm just writing it out. So this is now the average of my features in group one minus the average of these features in group two. But I did take the log, right? So essentially my workflow was I have a peak intensity, I take the log, I calculate the average, right? So now I'm working backwards, so this is the average of log intensities in each group. So I just write, okay, these were actually the log intensities. So X will be the intensity on the original scale, and Y is the intensity on the log scale. Okay, so this is the average of the log intensity in one group. This is the average of the log intensity in the other group. And so now the logarithms have these properties that the sum of the log is actually log of the product. So I can actually rewrite it like this. And then the differences of the logs, they're actually logs of the ratios. So all of this is to say that when we take the log of peak intensities and then do a t-test, so looking at the differences between the means, what we're actually quantifying or estimating in statistical terms is the log of the full change between the two groups, where the typical value in the group is actually a geometric mean. So this expression here, the product of all of the intensities to the power of one divided by number of features in subjects in the group, it's actually a geometric mean. So from now on, I will talk about the means and differences on the log scale. But if you are comfortable with ratios, think about log full changes as the logs of the 
ratio of the geometric group and mean in group one and geometric mean uh, in group two. And so now it is much more clear how each group is represented, right? So we're kind of going around the fact that ratio requires two numbers and which pairs of numbers we actually need to take. Does it make sense? Okay. So working with the log scale uh, from now on. Okay. So now let's talk about how we actually go about distinguishing signal from noise, right? So how do we distinguish the systematic change uh, in protein abundance from random variation? And so for this, we well, need a signal and we need a noise, right? So we need to know how much is the systematic shift. So we would actually construct this type of quantity where the numerator is our signal. So this is the difference of the means of protein abundances in each group, right? So this is exactly that, right? What we just discussed. So this is the estimate of the full change between the groups on the log scale. So this is our signal. In the numerator, we will try to characterize the amount of variation associated with the individual means. So let's take it apart a little bit. So here I'm putting at the very bottom is essentially the sample variance in group one, right? So how much each point deviates from the mean in the group, right? So this is, I hope you all know, right? So this is the just the sample variance in group one. So the same thing, I could write two instead of one. This will be the sample variance uh, in group two. So essentially, because we have multiple replicates, we can say, okay, this is how much variation we have in one group and how much variation we have in another group. However, this is not enough because our signals are not the individual points, but they're the means of the points. So what we actually need to do is to characterize how much uncertainty we have in the mean of the first group and how much uncertainty we have in the mean of the second group. So taking the sample variance and dividing this by the number of replicates characterizes the uncertainty in the mean. And the same thing here, taking the variance of the second group dividing by the number of replicates characterizes the uncertainty in the mean of the second group. So I'm sure it sounds confusing. So before we move any further, let me actually show you an example. And we'll come back to the formula, right? So um, essentially what we want to know is how confident we are in the mean of some number of subjects, right? So mean of protein abundance of some number of subjects. So let's just make a thought experiment. And today I will make a lot of references to this collection of um, vignettes called points of significance in nature methods. So actually these figures, they come from these vignettes and there is a text that comes with them. So if by the end of the day it's still confusing, you can actually go and read the text that is associated with that. Okay, so let's say that we have our protein abundances coming from a normal distribution. So let's say that's what we do. Let's say we have an experiment which has three replicates. So we take three replicates from this population, calculate the mean. Now we go back to the population, take three other replicates, calculate the mean. Go back to the population, three replicates, calculate the mean. So now we have multiple means of three replicates. So what I can do now, I can draw the histogram of these means. And so this is what this histogram would look like. Now instead, what I can do, instead of taking three replicates, I can take five replicates, right? So population, five replicates, calculate the mean. Go back, take some five other replicates, calculate the mean, right? Five more, calculate the mean, draw the histogram of the means. This is what it looks like. I can now repeat the same thing for 10 replicates. I can do the same thing for 20 replicates. So what you can see is that this histogram becomes narrower and narrower as we increase the sample size. Meaning that if the mean was calculated from 10 replicates, our next study will, is likely to have a very similar mean. However, if our study has three replicates, the next study may have some more different mean. So these histograms, they are called the sampling distribution. So how likely we are to have the mean that is reproducible. And so you see that if the mean is based on more replicates, it is more likely to be reproducible. It is more likely to be similar. Let's say you have one peptide per protein in your study. So you're just quantifying. It would be the same peptide across different replicates. Correct. It does not necessarily apply to seven peptides for the same protein. Nothing to do with that. So we're talking about biological variation. So let's say you have a magic tool which quantifies a protein. 
with a single number. And this can be just the area under the curve for one peptide, or it can be some really complicated software which gives you one number in there. Exactly, exactly. So really, this is not very close yet to mass spectrometry. It will get there, but for the moment, which I, let's just say you have a magic device which quantifies protein abundance in one person, and then you do it the same way for every other person. So what we're talking about here is biological variation, right? So we have three people take the mean of those proteins, right? Three other people take the mean. So those means will be much less reproducible than if you have the mean of 100 people, right? And then you have the mean of 100 other people. And so this shows that as the sample size increases, we're more and more confident in our mean, okay? And so turns out that for the normal distribution, we actually, so this is a nice illustration of this, right? But turns out that for the normal distribution, you don't even need to do this type of thought experiment because you can do the math. And the math can tell you that if you have that many replicates, this is what this histogram would look like. And you see that this histogram is roughly bell-shaped, so it turns out that this histogram is also distributed as a normal distribution. And now this quantity which I have here, the variance in the population divided by the sample size, it is actually the variance of this distribution. And it's very clear, right, the sample size is the denominator, so the larger the sample size, the narrower the distribution becomes. And so this allows us to essentially say, well, if my signal involves the mean of the first group, this is how much noise is associated with the mean of the first group, right? And so this noise comes from how likely I will be to see the same number if I repeat my experiment. Now, interestingly, the same thing holds even if your data are not normally distributed. And so this, in this vignette, what they did, they came up with some other pretty bizarre distributions, some skewed or uniform or some kind of really irregular distribution. So they do the same thing, right? They take three replicates, calculate the mean, three other replicates, calculate the mean, and so on. And you see that, well, two things. One is that even though the distributions themselves, they're kind of weird, the histograms of the means are quite nicely bell-shaped. And these histograms become narrow and narrow as sample size increases just the same way. Now, normal distributions become narrow faster, right? You see here, it's kind of wider if you compare it to this, right? But eventually, if you have enough replicates, it will also narrow down around the true mean. And so this is what is called the central limit theorem, which says that even if you start from some really weird distribution with many outliers and so on, if you have a large enough sample size, your mean will be approximately distributed as a normal distribution with a variance which is very nicely characterized uh, like that. And so kind of connecting this back to proteomics, one of the questions people ask me, all oh, my data are not normally distributed, right? So what can I do? And one easy answer to this is collect more replicates and clean central limit theory because the mean will be approximately normally distributed even if your initial data may indeed be skewed. Now, the more symmetric the data are, the faster the mean will converge to the true value. Meaning that essentially you need fewer replicates to be close to the, uh, to the mean. So it means that if you start with values on the original scale, which are skewed, right? Since we have an original scale, the peaks will be, tend to be kind of, have skewed towards large values. On the original scale, it will require a larger sample size to claim central limit theorem. On the log scale, it will require small sample size. So this is one of the arguments why we like to work on the log scale, because when we start with something which is already closer to the normal distribution, essentially we can get more sensitivity uh, and kind of it, 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 it helps. Does that make sense? So this is actually a fairly kind of um, important concept in statistics. So again, starting from any distribution, if we consider the means, so the uncertainty in the mean becomes less and less, and the variation around the center becomes more and more uh, bell-shaped. And all of that can be described analytically. So now I can go back to my formula. So remember our signal is the diff mean of one group versus mean of the other group. So now the noise is the uncertainty of the mean in first group and the uncertainty of the mean in the other group. And then I add them and I take a square root of them. So in terms of the vocabulary, this term here, which is the variance in the individual group, 
the variance divided by the sample size is the variance of the means here. So in statistical language, it's called the variance of the sampling distribution of the mean, right? So if we keep sampling data of the same sample size from our population, how much variation we'll have in the mean. And the square root of this is the standard error of the mean. And so this term is actually quite important. So if I take square root of this, it's standard deviation. If I take square root of this, it's a standard error. So these are really important concepts because they communicate very different things. Standard deviation communicates how much variation you have in the population. Standard error communicates how much uncertainty you have in the summary of your population, right? So for example, here, the population has a large standard deviation, but the mean of 20 subjects has a fairly small standard error. So these are really different types of variability that we uh, talk about. And so now what we did, we constructed essentially a signal-to-noise ratio, where the signal is the difference between the two groups which we want to learn about, and the noise is the uncertainty associated with these two differences between the groups. Okay. So essentially, I think probably now you are just thinking, okay, if the signal-to-noise is large, it means that it's more likely to be a systematic difference between the groups, right? If the signal-to-noise is small, it means that there is more variability than signal, right? So it's likely to be a uh, random chance. So now we just need to formalize this a little bit. So essentially the question is, how large is large, right? So how large signal-to-noise has to be to claim that this is not an artifact of random variation. And so for this, one way to do this, multiple ways to do this, but one way is hypothesis testing using a method such as a t-test. So hypothesis testing assumes, essentially works with these constants. Remember I talked about this population constants. Let me go back the mean in one population and the mean in the other population. So essentially, if a protein is not regulated, it is the same as saying the two means in the populations are identical. If the protein is regulated, we say that the difference between them is not zero, right? Now, we don't know what these values are. We will never know, but we can make guesses, right? And we can say, let's assume that in the populations, the two means are identical. So let's assume that and this is what is called the null hypothesis. So usually null hypothesis is something we actually want to reject, right? We want to, we're interested in something which would be different from that. So this is kind of the status quo, non-interesting situation. So let's assume that the two uh, means in the populations are identical. Now, the beauty of assuming normal distributions either exactly uh, in the case of normal distributions or approximately in the case of kind of some starting points which are not normal, is that it turns out that if the null hypothesis is actually true, we can mathematically describe the range of values which this ratio is likely to, to have. So essentially, if I, uh, oh, let's see, let me, let me jump all the way here. So we can say that if in reality, there is no difference between the two groups, then this ratio of signal to noise is likely to have this type of patterns which varies around zero. My zero disappeared here somehow. So maybe I can draw it for you here. So this is another probability distribution, meaning that it's likely to be concentrated around zero, and it is have smaller probability of being kind of on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side. And so this is really why it is useful for us to take the logs, work with sounds and differences, and assume a normal distribution either exactly or approximately, because then we can say, okay, these are the range of values which are likely to occur if, in fact, the null hypothesis is true. So if, in fact, there is no difference uh, between the means. So now, on the other hand, if there is a difference between the groups, then we know that, let's say, the first, just for the sake of the argument, let's say the first group was much larger than the second. So then we know that if, in reality, the first mean is, tends to be large, then this ratio will not fluctuate around zero. It will fluctuate around some positive number, right? A non-zero number. So now what we can do, we say, okay, these are the range of values which we expect to see if the null hypothesis is true. Now let's actually calculate this value for our data, right? So we have the signal, we have the noise, and let's overlay this value on top of what we expect to see. So now if we observe something which is here, 
right? So this is this quantity T, which I have here. We say, yeah, well, it's kind of in the range of values which I expected, right? So not surprising. Therefore, we don't really have any evidence that our assumption of no difference between the groups is wrong. On the other hand, if we overlay it on top of this here, we say, wait a minute, this is really unusual, because we expect values to be in this range. But we observe something in the very far tail of this distribution. So something is wrong. So what is the most obvious thing that's wrong? It's our assumption that there is no difference between the groups. So therefore, observing something which is inconsistent with the expected range of values, with the expected distribution, is evidence against our assumption. So it's evidence against the null hypothesis. And so the very last piece here is to say, well, OK, but we need to have a decision, right? So well, here it's probably, but how about here, right? Or how about here? So at which point we start saying that the observed value is not consistent with the uh, expected range or expected distribution of that. And so this is a probability distribution. So it has a property that area under this curve is the probability of the event. So for example, I can actually select cutoffs, like the red cutoffs over there, um, such that, say, the area under the curve in the, in the extreme side of this, in the extreme of this side, and the extreme of this side together is some type of probability that we set in advance. Let's say 5% or 1%. And usually the notation is, we call it alpha. And so let's say, and because it's symmetric, the distribution is symmetric, let's say we allocate alpha over to here and alpha over to here. And so now we will say, well, if we see this value of t, which is within this region, then we say that there is no evidence that it is not consistent with what we expect. On the other hand, if we see the observed values outside of these two ranges, then we say it is only has the probability of alpha to come from this distribution. So this is a small probability. And we say that there is evidence against the null hypothesis, and we reject the null hypothesis. Does it make sense? So that's really what's going on, right? And again, the assumption of normal distribution is important. What I didn't say, but it's also important, is the assumption that each person in our study is independent from another person. So if that doesn't hold, we can also have patterns which are not uh, consistent with the distribution, but that's kind of another story, right? So usually when experiments are designed, well designed, including things such as randomization, so on, this assumption is quite um, plausible. Okay, let me just review some of the things. Does it make sense? Okay, so I skipped a few slides here just to kind of um, get to the point. So let me just review this again. So this was one illustration of the sampling distribution, but here can be another illustration from the same vignette, so they took again this kind of irregular distribution, which is kind of weird, and now they c repeat the same thing three times. So they have, uh, they take random values, um, 10 replicates, 20 replicates, 30 replicates, and up to 100, and they illustrate the mean of this number of replicates, and you see it kind of fluctuates like that, um, and you see the standard deviation. So standard deviation is the square root of this number, right? So it also fluctuates and eventually converges, and the standard error converges to zero, right? So this mean standard deviation converges to the true values, standard error will converge to zero. So here's actually an important point in this plot, is that another problem with a small sample size. So one good thing about large sample size is that we are confident in the mean, right? So we have little variability around the mean, uh, with a small sample size, we don't have that. And here's another problem with a small sample size. So you see that the mean kind of fluctuates around the true value, kind of in all directions, right? The estimate of variability for small sample size is kind of systematically below the true value, the true horizontal line. So essentially what happens is that when the sample size is small, yet another undesirable artifact of that is that we underestimate the full extent of variability in our data. Just think about that. So if we take this distribution, which is kind of weird, right? Let's say we have three replicates from this distribution. All the three can kind of, by chance, can just come from this range of values, 
And so you say, well, what's standard deviation that's reflecting this variation? You just didn't have a chance to see that there's also this whole range of signal which just didn't get sampled. And so the standard deviation underestimates the full extent of variability. And if we underestimate the full extent of variability, our estimate of noise is too small. And so we're getting signal which is artificially enhanced. So we tend to have more false positives because of that. So there are really reasons to have replication to really make sure that our results are stable in terms of the signal, but also characterize the full variation in terms of the noise. So that's really important, right? And so this is just another uh, point that this also depends on how much biological variation we have, right? So this is kind of repeating the same thing. Let's say if we have healthy and diseased population. If we take only two replicates in this group and two replicates in this group, by chance, in disease they can come from the lower end, in health they can come from the higher end. We don't realize that we have all this possible variation. We think we have little noise here, little noise here, and we can essentially mistakenly think that there is a systematic change. So, same thing. Okay, so we have a t-test, right? So now we have a decision rule saying that if our signal to noise is in the tail of this distribution, so this is called a student distribution, uh, if our data come from something like that, and it approximates a normal distribution if our data come from a non-normal uh, population. So we know how to claim that there is a, uh, evidence against the null hypothesis. Now, another way to look at the same thing, so it's just a flip kind of side of exactly the same process, is instead of having these decision boundaries saying we reject outside and don't reject outside, is to actually look at the results of the signal-to-noise ratio from the data. So what I can do, I can overlay the calculated value of signal-to-noise on top of the range of these distributions, and I can look at the area, let me maybe do it here. So this is what I observe, maybe it's symmetric, so I will also overlay minus t of this, and I will look at the area to the right and to the left of the value which we actually calculated from the data. So now if this area is larger than alpha, it means that the calculated signal to noise is within the consistent region, right? If this area less than alpha, it means that it is outside of the rejection region. So this is just another way to look exactly at, at the same thing, right? And so this area to the left and the area to the right, this is the p-value. And so if the p-value is smaller than alpha, it is identical to saying that my signal to noise is in the rejection region. And if the p-value is larger than alpha, it's identical to saying it is not in the rejection region. So a equivalent way of kind of describing this decision is essentially in reporting the uh, p-values. Well, so that's really all there is, right, in terms of the t-test. So this is, uh, this is very simple. Now, the problem with t-test and the p-value, especially if you report p-value, is that you lose a lot of information from that. So if you say my p-value is point or whatever, something, right, you don't know how much signal you have, you don't know how much noise you have, you don't even know in which direction it changes, right? So essentially you are just saying it's significant or not significant. So a really good alternative way to report the results of your studies, actually not in terms of the uh, hypothesis testing and p-value, but also in terms of interval estimation. And so this is the next uh, topic here. So we can also report the estimates of our signal and overlay on top of this the estimates of variability. So essentially it's, uh, you know, uh, error bars, right? So that's what people kind of refer to as error bars. Now here's the problem. There's at least three types of error bars. And usually when Often when I see talks, people say, and here's an error bar plus minus something. If you don't know exactly what type of error bar we're talking about, it actually can end up being a very different message from the same plot. So we already talked about two types of variation which can give us two types of error bars. So standard deviation versus standard error. So looking at the mean of an individual group and say plus minus standard deviation tells you how much uncertainty you have or variability you have in the population. Having the same mean, but say plus minus standard error, tells you how much uncertainty you have in the mean. So these are very different things, right? So if I go back, let's say here, just to remind you the definitions, right? So if I have the mean plus minus standard deviation, I'm saying, okay, this is what happens in the population. 
However, if I have the mean plus minus standard error, I'm saying this is how much I'm confident in the mean. And remember, with large sample size, we can be very confident in the mean, even if a standard deviation is large. So it will be a very different message. And the last type of error bar is the confidence interval. So unlike plus minus standard deviation or plus minus standard error, confidence intervals have actually some probability of doing something. And so confidence interval, in fact, it's not a interval, it's actually a procedure. So the definition of a confidence interval is a procedure such that, let's say 95% confidence interval, is a procedure such that if you repeat this procedure 100 times, 95 times out of 100, the interval will contain the true value. So standard errors and standard deviations don't have this type of characterization. Confidence interval says that if I repeat this procedure over and over 100 times, 95 times out of 100, it will contain the true value in the population right that I'm interested in uh, studying. So, for example, here it's again from these vignettes. Let's say we just have one group to be simple. So again, there is this mean in the population, which we don't know, but we assume it exists. And we apply a procedure which gives essentially a lower and upper limit of the confidence interval. We do it 100 times, and we see that out of those, 95 intervals cover the true value, but 5 out of 100 will fall outside of the true value. Now, how do we do that? So if I go back to the signal-to-noise equation that I had before, we know what is the range of these values. Well, it turns out we just invert this equation. We refer to the same range of plausible values. So you see that here we look at the same signal as on the previous slide. Here we have the same noise corresponding to the signal which we had on this slide. And now this constants these are our decision boundaries, which we have. So essentially, we use exactly the same procedure, and we just invert. So this multiplier is the decision boundary corresponding to alpha in the previous slide. And so essentially, using exactly the same kind of mathematical argument, we can come up with a procedure which will say, if our individual data points are independent, and if our population is normal, or if it's approximately normal, then this type of procedure we can show mathematically that we, it will contain the true value 95 times out of 100. And so now this is nice because it contains the kind of sense of how big the signal is, and it also contains a sense of how much uncertainty we have. So now these three types of bars, they will be visually very different, and they will convey very different message, right, depending on what it is. So here from the same vignette, they compare standard error of the mean and the confidence interval. So here you have sample size, right? Here is the difference between the two groups. So this was in, this, in the case when there is no difference between the groups. And so if you have only three replicates, you see that standard error of the mean is the gray interval, and the confidence interval is much larger. Right? As sample size increases, both intervals become more and more narrow, but standard error of the mean is always smaller than the confidence interval because, well, confidence interval has this multiplier which reflects the plausible range of values. So, if you want to make a plot with an error bar, and if you want the error bars to look very small, <laughs> you use standard error of the mean, right? <laughs> However, you cannot claim anything about this containing the true value, right? You just say, well, this is how much data I had, essentially. That's what it shows, right? If you want to say something about this containing the true value, such as my uh, interval does not include zero, for example, right, which is really useful if we want to compare the two groups. If you only show plus minus standard error, it really doesn't tell you anything, right? However, a confidence interval will say 95 times out of 100, it contains the true value, and my current interval does not contain zero. Therefore, the difference between the two groups, right, has evidence of being non-zero. So if you want to make probabilistic statements about containing the true value, it is really important to actually have probabilistic argument there. So this is what confidence interval is doing. And standard deviations just say, okay, this is how variable my population was. Standard error says, this is how much data I have. Right? So these are really three different types of messages which are all conveyed with um, error bars. And this is kind of now putting this together, right? So in the context of uh, error bars versus uh, p-values. So I actually really like what they did here. So 
two groups, right? So this is group with the mean zero, and this is group with mean one, just kind of on some arbitrary uh, scale. Uh, they have 10 replicas, and they adjusted the variability in the underlying population such that these three types of intervals look exactly the same. So this is standard deviation, this is standard error of the mean, this is confidence interval. So if you have three types of error bars looking exactly identical, they correspond to really different p-values. So this confidence interval overlying corresponds to this p-value, exactly the same looking standard error of the mean is actually a very different p-value related to that, and the same thing for standard deviation. Now they do the opposite. So now they keep the variability in the population constant, and they keep the, the p-value constant, right? And so, so sorry, the, the p-value constant, and they uh, show different types of confidence intervals which correspond to the same p-value. So for the same p-value of 0.05, you see that confidence intervals can actually tolerate quite a bit of overlap. But standard error of the mean has to be very, very different to convey the same message, right? And the standard deviation, well, depends on how much variation we have in the population. So first thing, don't be too impressed by error bars when people just say, I have an error bar, right? Because it can be different things. And second, at the very least, document what kind of error bar it is in your own work, and then choose an error bar which actually conveys the message that you want to convey, right? So, so this is really important. And so unlike p-values, it really has a sense of this, how, how big the difference is, right? how much uncertainty we have, and so on. And this is just to show how, uh, just, just additional examples. So for different p range of p-values, what the confidence intervals would look like versus what standard error of the mean would look like. Right? So you see that, again, there's quite a bit of overlap in confidence intervals, which can be tolerated. Maybe it's not so nicely looking, but actually this looks more impressive, but it's in fact corresponds to the same type of conclusion. Questions? Yes? That exactly it shows it shows it shows I have a lot of data. That's all it exactly. says. Right? Right? But well but well we can kinda look at this uh, right there, right? So uh, let's say here if you put standard error of the mean so it looks like they're very different, right? And the confidence intervals look a lot more overlapped. But the conclusion as far as hypothesis testing is identical, right? So there's a little bit of, you know, people may kind of be trying to show really optimistic uh, plots like that, and they essentially people can easily misinterpret these plots, right? And so let's say your uh, alpha level was actually 0 0.01, in which case this does not really survive the significance cutoff, right? But this looks like they are different, you know? So you can really manipulate these plots to kind of imply something that is not quite right. So, well, I think the, the least that you could do is to document exactly what kind of error bar it is, right? So this is the minimum. And then when you read papers, right, or even like yourself, just to be critical of that, right? So even like very differently looking error bars may actually not be quite that meaningful, depending on what you want to show. Yeah. How much data do you need to make standard error? Well, it, there's no concept of valid versus not valid, right? So if you just look at this well, this is your standard error. There are two things to go into that, right? One is how much variability you have in the population versus how much sample size you have. So the same thing can be small for two reasons, right? Either your population regulates the protein very tightly, right? Or you have the protein very, very variable, but you have a very large sample size, right? So both could work the same way. So the flip side of that is that if you know that your protein is regulated, you will need smaller sample size to be confident in your mean, right? And if your protein is all over the place, then you need a large, much larger sample size. So it depends. And this is why I was kind of talking a lot about pilot experiments, because you need to have pilot data to know how much variation you even have in your uh, biological kind of system, right? But on top of that, we have technological variation. So that's another component as well. So this is exactly why the answer to how many samples do I need is it depends. 
right? It depends on exactly this type of uh, considerations. Are there any specific cases that we should be using Yeah, so confidence intervals are really good. For example, so what you really want to do is to distinguish statistical significance and practical significance, right? So yet another implication of that is if you have a very, very large sample size, you can make any standard error small, regardless of how big the biological variation or technological variation is, right? And so what is possible also is that you just have so many replicates, right, that you can pretty much show anything as being significant and have small p-value, right? And then you have full change of 1.000001, and it's statistically significant. Is it something you really want to worry about? Maybe not, right? But from the p-value, you will not be able to see that. From the error bars, you will be able to see that. And so that would be one uh, example of that. And maybe on the other side, too, maybe your study doesn't have enough uh, replicates, right? You will not be able to show significance, but then you say, well, these are my error bars, and the difference looks interesting enough for me to follow up on this and do more experiments, right? So it would not be enough to say, okay, this is my final answer, you know, and then the last thing in my paper, right? But it may be enough, interesting enough, that you want to follow up on that separately. So it really depends on which stage you are, but primarily I would use it to distinguish statistical significance and practical significance. So, you know, what I also see sometimes in collaborators, they're kind of really getting and you know, understanding how important statistics is and so on. So they kind of lose common sense, you know? So I feel like error bars, they're really helping you on the common sense side of things, right? To say, okay, do I really need to follow up on that? So we kind of need both. On the other hand, p-values, when you have a list of 10,000 proteins, you know that really helps you to filter on that. So it's really complementary, right? Okay, so here we go. So these are uh, hypothesis testing and p-value. So another aspect which is also important and especially is important for uh, sample size calculation is the concept of statistical power. So essentially we do that even though we assume the no hypothesis, right, that there is no difference between the groups. We actually do these experiments because we're interested in differences, right, and we want to find the differences if those exist. And so statistical power is a probability to find the difference when it really exists, right? So the hypothesis test says, assume no difference, right? What are the plausible range of values? Statistical power says, what if there is a difference? How likely we are to find it? So this is what it looks like. So this plot, again, going from the uh, points of significance vignette, essentially reproduces this uh, situation, right? So if we have the null hypothesis, our signal-to-noise ratio is expected to fluctuate around zero. Let's say in this case we expect positive change, so we put it rejection region in one tail, it's totally possible, right? And as we said, that if in fact the first group is upregulated, we actually expect these values to be free, kind of more systematically on the positive side, right? So if in fact, so this is what happens if in fact the null hypothesis is true, but if in fact the alternative hypothesis is true. The true range of these values, right, the true distribution will be actually shifted to the right. So under the null hypothesis, we consider that. Let's say that we call this our rejection region, right? But in reality, the distribution will be this, and it will be shifted to the positive values because there is a difference between the groups. So under this alternative distribution, the blue area here is the probability to reject the null hypothesis if, in fact, the difference exists, right? So the pink is the probability to reject the null hypothesis if, in fact, there is no difference. The blue area is probability to reject the null hypothesis if, in fact, the difference exists. So this pink area is called type 1 error, so claiming changes when there is no change. The blue area is the power. It's claiming change when there is a change. So we want to control type 1 error but we all want to maximize the power. And so now, well, what we look at this kind of expression, so what allows us to increase the power? If we look at, the, at this expression, well, a simple way to increase the power is to have more type 1 error, right? So if we move our rejection region 
to the left, right? So now it's much easier. It takes less evidence, less signal to noise to claim difference. Of course, we increase power, but we also increase type one error, right? So this is not really the best way uh, to do this. So a better way is actually to understand what moves the entire distribution to more to the right. So when this signal to noise ratio can tend to be stronger positive on one hand, when the difference between the groups is larger, right? So if the protein is extremely upregulated, we will have this range much more to the right, and so it will have higher statistical power. On the other hand, if the denominator is small, we will also have the signal to noise moving more to the right. How can the denominator be small? If we have less biological variation, so those variances are smaller, or if we have larger sample size. So larger sample size will also make the denominator small, and the signal to noise will also move more to the right. And so we really have several things that we can work with. So if we work with biological systems which have a lot of regulation, we'll have more statistical power or sensitivity. If we have larger sample size, we will also have more power, right? But if we have larger biological variation, we will have less power. So this is all building exactly on the same signal-to-noise concept, right? But we just look at it now from our ability to detect uh, the true changes when they exist. Does it make sense? Questions? So. Another way to gain power, and this is something that we have been considering quite a bit in our own research, well, by the means of increasing the number of replicates, but sometimes it is difficult to have more replicates from the same condition. What if we have other conditions which are also relevant to the same population, but maybe not, they're not necessarily the two conditions which we are primarily interested in? Turns out that having a comparison with more than two groups is another way, potentially, to increase statistical power. And so this is how it works. So remember, we essentially have to have some estimates of variation in group one and group two, right? So now we have more than two groups. So let's say we have five groups. So in each group, we have protein abundance varying in some ways, right, around different means. So here, the horizontal line is the mean of the entire data set. And those green boxes, these are deviations of the mean in one group from the overall mean. So clearly, each group has its own mean, right? However, if we can assume that the variance around the means is the same for all the groups, or maybe have some kind of relationships to the variance depends on the mean or some other things like that, which is the same across all the groups, then we can still use the remaining groups to learn the amount of variation. And our estimates of variation will be more stable, and it will effectively amount to increasing the sample size so even if we want to compare group one and group two, if we happen to have also group three, four, and five, we can learn the variation from these groups, and it will be similar, will have a similar effect than if we only had two groups with a larger sample size. So occasionally, having more groups is easier, just because in terms of access to the samples. And also, well, it can be interesting for biological reasons, right? And so essentially, more complex designs oftentimes allow us to gain sensitivity as well, because we have more replicates and it allows us to see the extent of variation better. And so I don't have kind of notes on that, but everything I talk about here is comparing different groups, but we can also potentially have longitudinal studies when we have the same subject across time. This is another way to gain sensitivity as well. So essentially, the simple ways are reducing the variation, at least the technological variation, increase the sample size, work on systems which can have high regulation, more advanced ways are to make experimental designs more complex, which will also allow us to gain sensitivity. Well, anything which has nothing to do with your data. So essentially, which something that is defined before even start starting the experiment. I don't know, like definition of disease, right? So maybe you have some kind of known marker or some pathology examination or some, you know, phenotype which will tell you that this is mild disease, this is strong disease, right? This is healthy, right? And so on. What you don't want to do is to use the same data to say, well, let's just imagine, right? So I actually, th this is a real life situation. It's not even a hypothetical ex example. So let, let's see. 
I had a collaborator, so it was a complicated experiment. It was not so easy to see that, but it really amounted to that. So we had, a, let's say, protein one. And we had these measurements. And so the collaborator essentially said, let's call, let's say here, uh, let's call this, so just collected measurements across samples. So each cross here corresponds to, let's say, one person, right? And so the collaborator said, okay, let's call this healthy. And let's call this disease. And so now I want to know if there's a statistical difference or whatever, or statistical significance between healthy and disease. What do you think? Is it a good idea? Huh? What's the basis for the sign? Because these are small values and these are large values. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You cannot do that, right? Because these data points, they're not independent, right? You use the data twice, once to define the groups, and then say, okay, are they statistically significant? Well, what do you mean? So statistical significance means that, if I go all the way back, that there are populations, right? And we try to make conclusions if there is difference in the means of the underlying populations. What is the definition of populations? Well, these are for small numbers, these are for large numbers, right? So there's no concept of population, there's no concept of making conclusions about the underlying populations. Plus, these data points, they're not independent because you define this as being group one in the context of group two, because you know that group two has larger values. And so this is kind of trivial, right? But the experiment was complicated enough technologically that it took us a while to realize that this was what was going on. So going back to your question, you can do pretty much anything in terms of defining groups, provided that it's biologically meaningful and provided that you do not use any of the data points which you will actually include um, as evidence for that later. So there are cases where people stratify patients based on response to a particular drug and then measure differences between the stratified groups. Is that also? It's fine as long as it's stratified based on. So, so let's say you measure protein 2. And let's say this protein 2 was your, is known clinical marker, right? So there's absolutely nothing wrong in stratifying them in groups based on protein 2. And then you have all the other proteins now that you try to compare. So, that's those, so your stratification into groups can be on any type of phenotype, including molecular phenotype, right? Or including, you know, anything, right? But you cannot take the same numbers which were used to partition people in the groups, right? And then somehow say, are they statistically significant? And so, remember in the beginning I was talking about the importance of choice of words, right? So statistical significance is a vague enough term that we can kind of lose exactly what we're trying to do here, right? So comparing populations makes it very clear that you actually have to have a population to compare it, right? And the population can be defined with respect to some molecular marker or some other marker, right? Provided that you did not use the same numbers uh, here. That will add a lot of variability just because of the complexity and that you can't have reference all together and things like that. With the power of the fact that you have added more, is, does one trump the other? You know, it, it's, it's, it's a very common situation, so I would go for as simple as possible. That's my, that's my gut feeling. Exactly. No, no, no. Well, so, so including five groups instead of two, it's not that complicated, right? So, so, I mean, in many cases, right? So you definitely don't want to overdo it and start including some kind of time courses combined with groups and then combined with some additional okay, things. Combining time course with dose dependence, right? Exactly. And, and it's you possible. Keep those separate or we, and then well, so, see, everything I said so far, right, is conditional on the fact that our assumptions verify, such as the data are independent, right, meaning you have no batch effects, no kind of things like that, right, that you have some patterns of variation which are common across the groups or have some, at least, dependency on the mean that is common across the groups, right, um, and so on. So if at least one of these assumptions breaks down, the conclusion breaks down. And so when you start having very complicated experiments, it's very easy to introduce batch effects, introduce, you know, some dependencies. And so this is the argument against too much complexity, right? Yeah. So 
if you can have multiple groups or some additional design where you can still preserve the integrity of the experiment in terms of randomization, right, and minimizing batch effects, it's worth doing it because you essentially use your data in a more effective way. But if it's to the point that you don't have the integrity of the experiment anymore, then don't do it. And also I noticed that sometimes uh, people design experiments very, very complicated in terms of, okay, we cannot use all the groups, we'll use some subsets of groups, and then we'll make some subsets of comparisons. Also think in terms of the simplicity of data analysis, right? Because if the analysis becomes very complicated, it requires complicated methods. And I like to say that complicated methods fail in complicated ways, which you may not even realize. And so, therefore, like, go as complicated as you can handle with the known kind of methods and tools that you can control and you can handle but not more complicated than that. In this context, actually, you have five groups, right? Group one is healthy. Whatever, sure, and yeah. And group two to five are, let's say, breast cancer subtypes, four different subtypes. Sounds good. Each group has 10 patients. For example. So only 10 healthy you got and 40 patients. That's right. Is that still a decent... Uh, if you assume, again, just exactly what I was saying, right? So these conclusions hold with some assumptions. So if you have a pilot study which says, actually, my healthy and the cancer subtypes, they have very similar type of variation for the proteins I'm interested in, go for it. If it turns out that cancer is much more variable than healthy, which is often the case, you may want to get more data from the more variable system, right? So this is type of kind of more advanced uh, approaches to design that you can kind of, essentially you, little by little you relax the assumptions such as the same variation, right? And then it will kind of tell you, so for example, we can just look here, two groups, right? In my signal to noise ratio. So let's say group one is much more variable than group two, right? So this may be an argument of getting more replicates uh, from group one because it's more variable, right? Because it will more effectively reduce the denominator altogether, right? And so then you can kind of try to see and balance exactly what it would take to maximize the power while controlling the type 1 error rate. So, indeed, I'm kind of giving you like, you know, a, a short version here, but this is where kind of statistical expertise can really help, right? That and pilot data, where you really start seeing, okay, how much variation I have and how much I can accommodate. If you go like cold turkey without knowing anything about your data, well, you would use like really basic assumptions, which may fail. Okay, go ahead. So I was just wondering, the government people at the beginning address strong groups. If you have one unique group, I was wondering if the statistical analysis, the other analysis, can help us discover Meaning, discover groups from data? Yes. That would be, remember, the goal one that we had, right? So I'm kind of here in the goal two. Remember, unsupervised, supervised comparing means, supervised predicting individual, right? So everything I talk about here is comparing means. Now, if you try to discover groups, so the problem you come into is this, right? You don't have clearly defined populations. So you don't even know what you're looking for. So you don't have like a concept, okay, in this population I have the means, so how well I'm doing at guessing the means, right? So it will be different things. So what you could do is to look at how consistent these groupings are if you alter the content of your data set. For example, removing a few samples, adding a few samples, you know, so kind of, this will be a very different statistical technology. Uh, I was thinking more um, resampling, you know, just kind of if you add, I will talk about this next week, actually, a little bit, because, so, for the sake of this week, we are really staying with a comparison between the groups, but next week we'll do a little bit more other statistical goals uh, as well. But essentially the point is, because they're very different statistical questions, it would require very different statistical technology. And this really kind of ties into the very beginning of yesterday, right? We say we really need to match the methods to the questions. And so here the question is really the second goal, where we compare the means of known groups which are defined in advance either clinically, like, or based on molecular phenotypes, but before collecting the data. Well, so in terms of experimental design, what we care about is the signal-to-noise ratio, right? So if you look at this power calculation, this is really what we're doing, right? 
we are trying to maximize the uh, power, let's see here, maximize the power. So essentially we want this ratio go as much to the right as possible. So what would be the most effective use of our resources to make it go to the right as much as possible, right? So that's the idea. So you can essentially get some pilot data, understand how much variation you have from each group, and then kind of experiment with different configurations of sample size and and usually that's what we do. We don't just give you one number, we give you a sensitivity range, right? For different combinations of um, sample sizes, that's your power, right? And so on. And then you essentially decide also there's also the cost and sample availability, right? That comes into that and you can... Okay, Okay, but increase M2, I don't necessarily increase M1. Not necessarily, they don't have to be the same size. Yeah. And so there's just kind of the mass, right? But there's also the cost and sample availability, and you can kind of work with that. So the groups we are comparing, they don't need to be balanced? Or? No. no. So, well, the, the caveat and kind of to both of these comments is this. Remember what I was just saying? So the danger of being very unbalanced is that if you have one group which has a very small sample size, you just underestimate the extent of variation. And that's a different problem, right? And it's a problem. But if you have a reasonable sample size in both groups, they don't have to be the same. And reasonable sample size, uh, you can say by the effect of... The effect between the means, but also the effect of the variation, right? So remember, if you have very broad range of values, you need more data to cover this whole broad range, right? If it's very close, then just a few data points will give you that. Okay, so um, I don't think I'll finish today what I have, but it's okay, we have tomorrow, so no worries. Um, okay, so this is just to kind of give you a preview a little bit of, okay, so when we said more complex designs, right? So for example, having more groups, what we essentially do, we combine the information from different uh, groups to get the estimation of variability better. So this would require essentially more complexity in terms of representing the sources of variation in the data because we have more than two groups. And usually it kind of works uh, like that. So we will have some more complicated models which say, well, each individual signal, so each individual abundance of a protein in one subject has some contribution coming from the fact that this subject belongs to this particular group, then it can also have some contribution coming from the fact that it's from a particular subject, and then there's also maybe some technical variation. So essentially, we will look into this next week a little bit more, but what I talked about, uh, the t-test just right now, it's really the tip of the iceberg in terms of how we can partition the variation from different groups and potentially different subjects. So this type of signal-to-noise ratios, that can, they can be derived from much more complicated models. And this allows us to use the data more effectively. So we'll just talk about this um, later uh, in, the, yeah, in the class. So now that we can uh, spend some time talking about the p-values, right, and how we can use them, I would really like to spend time on essentially telling you how bad they are, right? And uh, they're useful, right? But sometimes people just kind of attach too much importance to them, right? You know, I need to have this p-value 0.049 to publish my results, right? Or else. And so I just want you to take this with a grain of salt, right? And really not be kind of too... Uh, essentially, don't optimize for p-values. That's what I'm saying, right? So use common sense and use understanding of where these p-values come from. So um, as a starting point for that is that the, there's a fact that p-values have been so much abused in, in overused and misused in scientific literature that American Statistical Association had to, well, they felt compelled to issue a statement about the appropriate use of uh, p-values. And to tell you, American Statistical Association doesn't issue any statements like that usually. That's really not their normal practice. But I think they really felt strongly that it was really given too much importance, more importance than it was really intended uh, originally. And so they had a whole group of very famous statisticians coming together discussing about what would be the right guidelines. They came up with six points that they suggest. So uh, this is the summary. So p-values can indicate how incompatible the data are 
with a specified statistical model, right? So that's exactly what we did. So we had the assumption that there is no difference between the two groups. So this was the range of values. Uh, we calculate the signal to noise. It's here. We say, wait, it's too far from the distribution, so it's incompatible. Therefore, our assumption of no difference between the groups is wrong, right? So fair enough. So p-values do not measure the probability that the null hypothesis is true. So if you have p-value of 0 0.05, it doesn't mean that the probability of the null hypothesis is 0 0.05. Hypotheses do not have probabilities in this framework. So we have two means, mean of group one and mean of group two. And these are constants. And they're either the same or they're different. There's no probability associated with them in this particular framework. There's another framework called Bayesian statistics where it would be true, but it does completely different things. So from what we talk about here, we cannot use p-values as a probability of characterizing null hypothesis. Now, that's getting kind of closer to the practical and common sense. Uh, scientific conclusions and business policy decisions should not be based on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. So your publication should not depend <laughs> on whether your p-value is 0.05 or less, right? And this is very important. And why it is the case, we will actually see quite a bit. I really hope we have um, time for that. And three more. Proper inference requires full reporting and transparency. And I really hope that by the end of this and next week, we will get this down. So we need to fully document what we do, including all steps of data manipulation. Therefore, Excel and such are really not helping us in terms of reproducibility, because it's very easy to manipulate p-values. And I actually hope to show you these examples. If not today, then uh, tomorrow for sure. So a p-value or statistical significance does not measure how big the difference is, right? So the size of an effect, so the numerator, right, the, the, the signal, or the importance of results. So if we have a small p-value, it doesn't mean that our finding is important, right? Because we can have a very large sample size, which will give us small p-value. It doesn't mean that it's practically significant, or practically important. And by itself, the p-value doesn't provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or a hypothesis. For example, if I have a small p-value, it doesn't mean that I made a good hypothesis, right? It doesn't mean that I did something which really is scientifically important. So these, these are really uh, important statements for that. So now let me illustrate this a little bit. So fundamentally, remember we talked about central limit theorem, right? When we take the mean and then take another mean and then draw the histogram, they're not the same, right? They have a distribution. So a mean is a summary from the data. It's some kind of you know, manipulation of the data that we acquire and we get a summary from this. Well, p-value is based on the summary of the data, right? So just translated by overlaying the summary of the data, the signal to noise, and getting the tail area of this. So since p-value depends on the data, and since data have variability, p-value also has variability meaning that p-value is a random variable, meaning that if you repeat the same experiment, we should not expect at all the same numeric value of a p-value, even not necessarily in the same range, because p-value itself is subject of, to variation. And so this, uh, this also comes from nature methods. It's from a different publication, but it's a very good summary of that. So they take two groups, population A and population B, and for their ex completely uh, fictional, right, so simulated data, they have two groups which are very similar to each other. So the difference between the two groups is 0.5, but the variability in each group is fairly large, right? So the two groups overlap substantially. So now they take 10 data points from population A and 10 data points from population B. So this is population and this is population. It looks quite nice, right? So there is a difference between the two groups. P-value is 0.005. So if we only had that, we would say, yeah, that's kind of nice, right? So it looks like this difference is not an artifact of random chance. But then they repeat it again, and they have this. The difference between the groups goes in the opposite direction, minus 0.08, and the p-value is 0.82. So this looks like super statistically significant. This is not significant at all. Repeat it again. Now the difference is 0.08 in the po yet positive direction. P-value is even larger, right? And then again. So exactly the same problem where everything is known, you see how p-value varies all over the place. And so just like the signal to noise depends on the sample size, p-value obviously also depends the same way on the sample size.
So the next thing they do, they don't just have four simulations, they have thousand simulations like that. So they repeat the same thing. And so now they, just like before we did the histograms of means, right, now they have the histograms of p-values. So the only thing they did, they had the log of a p-value so that they can kind of zoom into the uh, small values because we're interested in small values usually. So here we have sample size of 10. So they have 10 groups, 10 samples from population A, 10 from population B. They do it 1,000 times, and they draw a histogram. So you see that only 186 instances out of 1,000 have small p-values. The majority have large p-values. Now they increase the sample size to 30, so now they have 469 with small p-values, right? 64, they have 800 with small p-values. And only with sample size of 100, they have a real substantial majority of p-values being very small. So that's, again, just another view on the same problem of the sample size, that how much our results can be irreproducible even if we have small p-values, right? So do not optimize the experiments for small p-values. But this is, to me, the most interesting part, actually, of their paper. So they were, look, were looking not only at the p-values, but also at the estimate of difference between the two groups, so the estimate of the difference here. So same thing, right? So 10 replicates, 30, 64, and 100. So now they just make a bivariate plot where the x-axis is the log p-values, the same as here. And the y-axis is the estimates of difference between the groups, right? And so you see that when the sample size is small, p-values tend to be large, right? And then p-values kind of go towards small values as the sample size increases, as we expect. The interesting part is here. So they're actually plotting the histograms of the difference between the two groups, but only among the subset of comparisons which are significant. So if the p-value is less than 0.05, the difference is included in this histogram. If the p-value is more than 0.05, they skip it. So essentially, they only report significant results, right? And they do not report results that are not significant. So now look here. This axis here is the difference between the groups. This value is 0.5. So in 10 replicates, not only the majority of p-values is large, so not only the majority of things are not statistically significant, those that are significant dramatically overestimate the difference between the groups because nothing is below the true difference. Everything is above. Increasing the sample size, so a little bit we have some differences are around 0 0.5, 64. So only with 100 replicates, now the estimates of difference between the two groups fluctuate around the true value. So yet another kind of issue with reporting only significant results, especially when the studies have small sample size, is that first, you don't find many things, but second, if you do find, you are very likely to overstate dramatically the magnitude of regulation. And so essentially, it all kind of leads to incorrect expectations, right, and false hopes, right, for that. And p-values are kind of, you know, complicit in that, uh, if you want. And so now, in fact, uh, confidence intervals have exactly the same problem as um, everything else. So again, they repeat the same thing, but now drawing confidence intervals for 10 replicates, 30 or 100 replicates. So as we said, that when sample size increases, the intervals become uh, narrower and narrower, right? But they become much more consistent when the sample size is larger, right? And things will be uh, varying here. Okay. So this is the, um, essentially the lack of stability of p-values, right? An overstatement of findings. Any comments on that? Okay. All right, we have, let's take a couple more minutes just to start on the next topic and we will have to finish it tomorrow uh, in the next uh, lecture. So um, another problem with p-values and generally with hypothesis testing is that everything that we discussed so far is really characterizing one particular protein, right? So we say, okay, let's say we have this magic technology which quantifies a protein, we have multiple replicates, we want to know if the protein is changing or not, right? In the type of experiments we talk about here, we don't have one protein, we have a lot more proteins. And so we have to do this over and over and over again for every protein in the study. And it turns out that this particular aspect 
also makes things more difficult for us in terms of reproducible research. So here's one example. And uh, this is just kind of a curiosity also from Jeff Lick, who publishes some of these things like that on his blog. On his blog. So this was a study, fMRI study, of brain regions of dead fish. And so this scientist found many active brain regions in dead fish. And so dead fish has active brain regions, right? So that's something is wrong here, right? So what happened was that fMRI essentially studies many different locations on the image of the brain, right? And for each location, it says, okay, is there a difference or not? And remember, we talk about type 1 error, right? That we have 5% or 10% probability of finding a difference when there is no difference in reality, right? So if we do 100 of those tests, 5% is 5 changes that we find, right? If we do 1,000 tests, we find 50, right? And so on. So essentially, if we work, look hard enough, we will end up finding something with the pre-specified probability. So in our context, looking hard enough means looking at more and more and more proteins. And if we look at more of them, we'll always find something which appears to be different um, just by uh, random chance. And so this is where probably I will stop. We will talk about this uh, tomorrow, but let me just give you some examples. I put here one link to a uh, website which is, oops, essentially illustrates that. Let's see if I can get on this tab now. Okay, so let's say we have, so here's what it does. So let's see if I can refresh it maybe. Oh, I'm not a Windows user. Okay, so this is what we'll do. We have two groups. Let's call this group um, disease. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, let's call this group control. Okay, so how many participants in each group? So sample size. Okay, let's say 20, right? True effect in the population, true difference between the two groups. Let's say no, right? Let's say they're all the same, right? So that we only find false positives. Number of dependent variables, so number of proteins in our study. So let's go crazy and let's have 10 proteins in our study altogether. So now we're essentially what this um, app is doing, it will generate data from populations which have no true difference, so no regulation of the protein, they have 20 replicates, and now we will see if out of, out of 10 proteins what we can find. Okay, we run an experiment from here. Okay, nothing is significant, right? But let me try it again. Okay, so we don't... Oh. Let's let's see if we can change the sample size a little bit. A new experiment. Of course, it's always like that when you want to show it live. Ah, come on. Nothing works. I don't know how to use this computer. All right, here we go. So it took us just a, a couple trials to find things which have uh, significant p-values, right? So if we just do it enough times, we will always find... I don't think it works properly here. If we do it enough times, we can always find... Um, so let's see if I can have a larger number of participants. Here we go. Right, so I just think that there's a delay there. So essentially, if we try a few times, right, and we have a large enough sample size, just by virtue of multiple testing, we can always find things which appear significant um, just from any random chance, right? Because again, out of 100 tests, at least five we will find as differentially abundant, right, if you look at protein abundances, without doing anything else about this. So essentially, we need to change our procedure. So the conclusion is that if we want to consider more than one protein at a time, we need to account for the errors which occur in the whole collection of experiments, as opposed to just one protein at a time. And I wanted to tell you about that, but I'm running out of time, so we'll just come back to this uh, tomorrow morning. Any questions about that, just before we finish here? Yes. So, uh, what is the trend of the number of significant uh, proteins that we get as we keep increasing the sample size? If we increase the sample size, we should ideally have less significant proteins if the two effect is equal? Well, uh, 
that's what this that's what the slides indicate but what you can do just you can experiment with this right now so I have the URL but uh, it is true that the larger the sample size the more you will cover the full extent of our ability and the more you will realize that there is no uh, difference between between the groups on the other hand if the group the difference is very small you will be seeing this more and more right because you will be able to narrow down on this particular uh, on this particular difference okay so I think now it's time for us to take a break.